Hello, and welcome back to the next episode of this Healthy Life podcast. I'm very excited for my guest today. I have Kendra Williams, and we also have potentially a special guest, Suki, our gluten detection dog. And I'm so excited to learn all about your process, having Suki, training her, and what life is like with celiac disease, and having this great companion that helps you kind of detect all your food. So Kendra, welcome. Um, I'm really happy to have you here today. Thank you so much, Erica. It's great to be here. Uh, so let's start like sharing a little bit about your story. So you were diagnosed with celiac disease in 2017, and I'm, I was diagnosed myself in 2012, so I know it's such a struggle, especially when you first get diagnosed and navigating the world and figuring out what you can eat and try not to get sick in the meantime. So I would love to hear a little bit about your journey, how you got diagnosed, and what that was like for you. It was a long and winding road. Um, <laughs> so I actually was super sick for the better part of 2017, like very, very ill, went to tons of different doctors. And I finally went to an integrative doctor who, a rheumatologist, who was able to diagnose me with celiac disease because my symptoms were something completely different than what you normally saw. I had um, terrible cough. Mm. Like I could not get rid of my cough. Wow. I had pneumonia. And so he diagnosed me and was like, you know, you have to go gluten free. And then that began the journey of trying to live gluten free. And in my work, I traveled all the time. Mm -hmm. And so because I was so sick, I wasn't able to travel. And then when I finally got back to traveling, I mean, I had a team of people who worked in St. Louis. I live in San Diego. So I was back and forth to St. Louis all the time. That requires a lot of eating out. It requires a lot of different stuff. So then I was getting sick frequently too. And, um, it just made it really hard to kind of navigate life. And, you know, everybody says it seems super simple. Just eat gluten-free, but it's, it's not, not that so simple easy. when you have celiac yeah. disease. No, it's not. And that's so interesting that you mentioned that you had a cough as like one of your symptoms that helped you get diagnosed, which, you know, when most people think of celiac disease or gluten, it's all gut issues. And I myself I actually don't even get any gut issues. I get all neuro symptoms. So it's so interesting to see how it manifests so differently in so many people and you're lucky that you were able to get diagnosed with that sort of symptom set. It's crazy. I mean, after I was diagnosed, I had everything else too, but it was like, you didn't put it all together to go, okay, wow. You know, I basically was th almost throwing up every morning, you know, on a random basis. I had mm. tons of gastro issues. I just didn't really realize it. And then, um, yeah, after I was diagnosed. So then going out and I just got sick every time I went out. And so I kept looking into, I looked into when I heard about gluten detection dogs, I was like, you know what, that would be great. Maybe once my dog, I had an older dog, um, you know, for my next dog, I can do that. But then you travel all the time. You can't really train a dog and, you know, it just is a lot. And then when the pandemic happened, and we were home and my dog at the time was 16 was like, well, you know, start planning for that. And it now would be the perfect time to get a puppy and train a puppy. And so that was kind of everything how, worked out. So how Suki came into the world. That's so how tell Suki us, came. She was. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Suki. So tell us kind of what breed she is and, you know, how are there certain breeds that are good for gluten detection dogs versus others? So I'd love to hear how you how you landed on Suki and maybe we'll be lucky enough to have her make a, a special yeah, guest I'll appearance today. You, I'll introduce Aww, you. Here, she, here hi, she is. I'm bribing her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> there she is. She's so cute. She is. Okay. Can you sit? You're not sitting. You're not behaving very well. There you go. Um, so she is a she's a Portuguese water dog. So she's four years old now. She was born in March of 2020, mm -hmm. and she um, I got her as a puppy. So I do not recommend Portuguese water dogs as gluten detection dogs because they are a challenging breed to have. So I had had a Portuguese water dog, so that's why I chose her. Mm -hmm. um, they're working dogs, but they're super smart, and they kind of are not necessarily the easiest to stay on top of. So I'll, I'll say that first off. Okay. I, love her. I, I personally am a Portuguese water dog fan, mm -hmm. but they're extremely challenging, and anybody that has Portuguese water dogs will tell you the same. But okay. um so I recommend, you know, so I got her as a puppy 
And I kind of went about everything completely wrong. I just, you know, go, yeah, I want a Portuguese water dog um, because I had one before. And then I started looking for breeders and I found a breeder and, and then I found a trainer and I chose, you know, worked with the breeder and I did not choose a trainer originally that was in gluten detection. Mm-hmm. I just went to a service dog trainer. So it was all these pieces that I totally don't recommend. I recommend you start with the trainer first um, because they're the ones that then will help you figure out what's the right dog for you. So what's the breed, um, you know, all that stuff, because it does matter your lifestyle, what you do, um, your you know, training expertise is also important because it's owner training, your handler training. So you work with a trainer over Zoom and they teach you, but you do the training hands on. Yeah. So, you know, make most of sure. dog training is training the, the owner, right? Versus the dog, really. It's like training it's the dog. humans yes. to, to do everything Absolutely. right. Absolutely. But then the part of gluten detection training is you are an active participant. You're at least 50% of the deal versus. You know, you can train behaviors of dogs and that's not necessarily easy, but it's pretty straightforward. This, you're constantly in new environments and you are depending on this dog for your health. So your movements and there's, it's a very complex. So Suki's job is she checks for gluten. So she checks it in my groceries, when I go to the grocery store, she shops with me. She checks my medicine. So she checks all the packages, everything that I have. But then she also goes with me to restaurants and she sniffs my plates of food and checks my plates of food. So every time you're pre- each one of those things is a different task, basically. So think about training all that. But then your body positioning is also a big part of it. So how I hold the plate, how I move, how I blink, how all that stuff, it's, you would not even guess how in depth it is that the dogs are able to read because dogs read more body language than they do verbal commands. And you may see that if you, you know, you have, I know you have dogs and, you know, when you're telling them to sit, you do with hand motions and things like that. Literally a tiny movement of, you know, you turned your hand out instead of your hand straight, you pushed into her, that's signaling her. You presented too many, you you did the same sequence of foods presented. So now she's caught on to the sequence. So she knows you're doing gluten-free, gluten-free, gluten. Mm, And so all- So she can pick up all those patterns. They pick up the patterns. And without a trainer watching you, you don't know because I didn't know that they're like, oh, you moved your foot forward. Oh, you dropped your head. Um, you turned your body to the right. All those things. I can't see that I do that. And we all have our own things. So without, so that's, that's the trainer super important. And then on the front end, the trainer would have helped me pick out the right dog. So I hear tons of horror stories right now about people that got a dog that doesn't fit their lifestyle um, or their abilities, you know? So maybe you have like a lot of people, unfortunately with celiac disease have multiple autoimmune diseases. And so they may have, you know, for example, mobility issues and things like that, but you know, a more powerful dog or a dog that requires a lot more exercise, probably not the best choice for somebody that has a ton of mobility issues. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, kind of how it works you get the dog and then and then you start with the training start training and then so what's the best way to find a trainer that specifically works for training gluten detection dogs is there like a good website or a good resource to go to or is it just kind of you just got to find what's in your area and take your chances (laughs) I I don't recommend doing that because I also hear the horror stories of people you know I paid fifteen thousand dollars for a dog that they sold me as a fully trained dog that's six months old and the dog is not potty trained. Oh, no. um, so that do not get dogs. I have uh, articles on my website that really go through. And here's a checklist for an interview guide. I have a couple trainers that I do recommend. Um, so that's um, 
the originator of gluten detection dogs is Don Choi from Willow Service Dogs. She's booked out probably three years in the future. Oh, um, oh. And then, um, yeah, yeah. So she rarely gets openings, but she does get openings, but she has a very long, uh, you know, she's, she doesn't, she doesn't even have a waiting list cause she's, she's that in demand. And then I have another, another trainer um, that I work with that is, is amazing. And that's Carrie Bastier and, mm-hmm. um, and her business is wagon train. And I have them all linked on my website. So those are the trainers that I recommend. Um, I mean, there are other gluten. I, I only recommend people working with trainers that specify in gluten detection. And it's really important to do that. Don't get a trainer that, you know, like the first trainer I worked with that was a service dog trainer. And she said, oh, and I can train gluten detection. And that's how I ended up meeting Carrie because I was training with Loose Flower and showing my cute dog on social media going, how great is she? How smart is she? And Carrie reached out to me and said, you are going to kill yourself. Oh um, Carrie also has celiac disease, as does Dawn. So they're very intimately um, in the process. So yeah. So that's kind of how it works. So you, you really do have to be super selective and just know that it's not a, hey, I decided I want a dog and I'm going to start next month. It doesn't usually work that way. Um, You have to plan for it. So if somebody today is thinking, I I hear from a lot of people with young kids that go, you know what, I want one when my kid is like in high school so that they can kind of be fully trained and go off to college. That's great, but you need to start planning for it and figure out what that lead time is because it may take time to find, you know, the right breeder and find the right puppy because not every puppy in a litter is going to be a service dog ready puppy. You know, we can, we can plan for it. And we work with, you know, you always want to work with breeders that are super ethical and that are doing a lot of the um, early neurological stimulation in the puppies to get them kind of conditioned to outside environments and stuff like that. So they're conditioning to be handled. They're conditioning them to noises. They're conditioning them to, you know, different surfaces and things like that. That's great. And, and I recommend that for people that are going for pet dogs too. You want a breeder that is doing all those things, Absolutely. but um, you still don't know there's, there's dogs that you go, wow, they're there. They did all that stuff, but they just don't have that inner personality to deal with it. And sometimes litters don't have, you know, there, there might not be the right fit for, for what you need. So, so it is a process, but it's worth the wait. And, and for, you know, I don't want people to go, Hey, I want to do this and then rush out and make bad decisions. Cause yeah. I've already, I've probably talked to five people already just in a very short period of time that have been really upset and then have to figure out, you know, the gal with the, the dog that wasn't even potty trained, mm-hmm. do oh, I then spend money for to regular train training. this dog? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah from, sounds- from day one. And, and I think, I think she is last I had talked to her, she was going to, going to start working with um, a trainer I recommended. So a lot of work. We'll I mean, puppies on their own are a lot of work and then kind of creating that extra layer of teaching them to be a service dog and have this task that they have to complete. It's like a whole other set of, of trading on top of it. So it's a, it's a handful. So what is a a day in the life with like Suki? Like, so do you take her pretty much every time you go out to eat grocery shopping? And then what does it look like when you go to social events? So say like a wedding, do you take her to a wedding so that she can sniff food there or work events and conferences? Like what is, where do you take her and where do you kind of limit taking her? She has yet not gone to a wedding yet, <laughs> um, but she but she would, and actually that was super stressful. I did go to one wedding without her, and it was it was it's very it was very stressful. Once you're used to her, it's hard not to have her without. But we she has been to nine different states. Um, she's been to trade shows and business meetings and conferences. Um, so when she goes, she travels with me on the plane, and she goes underneath the seat in front of me or, you know, if we're in the bulkhead, basically at my feet. Um, she is a full service dog, so she's allowed to travel everywhere. 
we go to, you know, she stays in the hotel with me. We go to restaurants and she will stay underneath the table. And then she gets up and comes out and I hold the plate out. And she sniffs the food. She sniffs anything that I might have to drink, you know, napkins, silverware, everything that would come close to my mouth. She checks everything there. Um, conferences, trade shows, she goes with me. She's walking along next to me. Business meetings, she's in the business meeting with me. I mean, depending on where it is, I uh, my company's had some meetings and we stay in the same hotel. So a lot of times I just have her stay in the room in between. She comes down for mealtimes. That's more fun for her. It's less mm-hmm. stressful for me. Yeah, she gets to relax. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's, you know, the always on, like when she's working. And and when you're going with a service dog, there's still a dog. So we're going for walks. We're playing with toys in the hotel room. We're, um, her favorite thing is her ball. We're playing ball and and doing all that stuff. And then on a regular day at home, she, I work from home. She is on a bed in my office. She is underneath <laughs> my desk. She is on the couch downstairs or now, cause it's so hot. She loves to lay on the bathroom tile. Um, we go for walks basically morning, noon and night. Um, and she's, like I said, a ball fiend. So you can find me at the park. <laughs> I love, I love her, little... her yapp- yappy hour ex- videos. I love, uh, that's the thing you're having the fun at the park. Thing. Every, <laughs> every day we have yappy hour in my neighborhood. So all my friends get together with our dogs and they're all dogs that have grown up together. I mean, we kind of started it during the pandemic. And so there's any, anywhere from, you know, four to 10 dogs every single day. Uh, so it's really fun. So the dogs all have their friends and we have our friends and it's, um, it's a great social hour. And then we do yeah. things up. We're, we're friends, we're neighbors. And yeah. so we do things outside of that, but it's really neat because the dogs, um, you know, love each other and then they're dogs. So, so it's really funny because in that environment, people have no idea. I mean, the ones that know me really well, but we'll have people that are, you know, more just casually come. And then I'll mention, so they're like, wow, she's such a good dog. I'm like, oh yeah, so that's because she's a service dog. Like, I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> that's cute. So, so when you've taken Suki out, what's one of the most kind of interesting or things that kind of three for a loop that she sniffed that had gluten that you were surprised had gluten in it. What's kind of, or like one or two of like uh, most interesting finds. Well, I mean, the hardest one for me is medicine. Mm -hmm. So she's found it in medicine and um, that's, that's, that's a scary thing because you don't have a, you don't have a choice. And in the United States, our medicine's not labeled for any allergens. So there are no call outs um, like there are on food. Um, and although food doesn't have a call out for gluten, you have to search the ingredients for gluten containing ingredients. So medicine is the hardest in, in places. One of the most surprising to me was I went to a tea house with her and they were really good. And they had a full separate bake. They baked gluten-free items separately. They were stored in a separate refrigerator their handling, everything was good. And so I had her check every item on the tea. It was a, you know, a formal tea and the tea service going through it. And the one, one of the items was um, positive for gluten. Hmm. And it was the what one was I would it? least expect. Which was? It was the macaron, which is oh. not made with any gluten. No. But my assumption on that, and I didn't end up following up with the place. And next time I go there, I'll have to ask them. I'm assuming that they probably, because those were on both plates, the gluten plate and the gluten-free plate, they probably were handling those with gloves, you know, or, or touching those to put on the gluten plates and it just got cross contact from yep. people handling them or yep. that hand going in that had some gluten on it. Um, the other thing that surprises me too is she alerts very often to frozen food. Um, and so she sniffs through the packaging when we're in grocery stores, mm-hmm. but, um, if, so if there's gluten inside, she can smell it, 
But that also means that if there's gluten on the outside of the package, she smells it. So, you know, obviously in a store, I don't buy something that she alerts to. So, but, you know, especially during the pandemic, you're getting a lot of grocery delivery. I still do grocery delivery because it's convenient. But um, most times when I get frozen food, she alerts to it because that gluten is super sticky and it sticks to the outside of the packages, especially in, in the frozen, frozen food. food. It's just because those packages are stickier too, just because yeah. they're frozen. So do you take things out of the packaging and then have her sniff again? Exactly. Yeah. So I take it out of the package and then have her sniff the food on a clean plate or, or, or whatnot. So yeah, those are the, those are the things. I mean, but gluten is in weird stuff but for me. You know, most people, I think the things that are surprising to most people are like licorice has gluten in it. Um, it's made with wheat flour. Uh, there's quite a few mustards, like especially some of the more gourmet mustards that have flour in it. There is a coffee creamer at Trader Joe's. It's like a coconut creamer that has gluten in it. It has barley malt in it. So weird, weird stuff. Pretty crazy. Yeah. And then, so how do you handle, so say you're out to eat and say like, you know, like you mentioned, you're having like the tea service and one of the items or something on the plate test for gluten because Suki smells it. How do you approach the restaurants? Tell them, be like, Hey, this is my dog. She smells gluten or like, what's kind of your approach and how have restaurants been receptive to it? That's exactly what I tell them. I mean, usually I always tell them when I come in, you know, I need my service dog is going to be here to make sure we can get a seat that maybe is going to be, you know, a little off the beaten path for her or just a place where she can more comfortably go under the table. You know, sometimes like I went someplace yesterday and they gave me a booth that was not great. And I'm like, could we just have a little bit different of a seating arrangement? But so they always know she's there and kind of why she's there. Cause a lot of times I will tell them and her vest says gluten detection dog, but I just tell them, Hey, by the way, and obviously when I go, I also am very vocal that I have celiac disease because the one thing about having a gluten detection dog is you still have to do everything yeah. that you do without a gluten detection exactly. dog. So you have to have, ask all the questions and be really specific about ordering. So then when it comes out and she alerts, then I let them know, Hey, this, this, you know, we found gluten in it. And depending on the place, I will ask them to remake it or, if I don't get a good feel, you know, sometimes you go places in like, like, this oh. is marginal at best. Yeah. I might not, I might not be in a good position to eat safely here. Mm -hmm. In that instance, I would just tell them and then go, you know what? No, thank you. I'll just have my water and, you know, eat my snack from my purse kind of a situation. But it, it, the good news is, is it doesn't happen as often as I thought it happened. Um, so, I mean, obviously I've been living with celiac disease now for a lot longer. So my skills are significantly better. I am more confident to ask the questions, you know, that I wasn't early on when I was getting sick all the time. I think I just yeah. thought it would magically be safe. And, um, <laughs> the longer you live I with the think... disease, you know, that that is not a case. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think restaurants are getting better. There's more awareness. I mean, I was diagnosed 12 years ago and it was like very hit or miss. And especially in the last few years, I feel like there's more awareness. People understand what it is. There's more people eating gluten free. And of course, you still have to do your research, you know, look into restaurants before you even go to them, check out the menus and ask all the right questions. But I do agree. It's getting a little bit easier to eat out. And there's also so many new like dedicated gluten free restaurants, which are so great, too. Um, makes it easy to just be able to eat safely, even though I have been glutened by a few dedicated gluten free restaurants here and there around the world. But it's still it's still hit or miss. Right. And, and that's the hard part, too, because especially I was actually talking to one of my followers this week that uh, a gluten free place. They're like, oh, well, they they've added gluten. So now they are, or it was, no, it was a vegan place. And so she said, and it's gluten free. And I said, sometimes those places I'm a little more cautious of because they may be coincidentally gluten free um, because that fits often with a vegan lifestyle, but they're not as strictly gluten free as a gluten free place first. Yeah. So yeah. especially in the area of oats, I do find that that's probably my biggest 
area that I worry about and, um, you know, and all those things that I ask a lot of questions about oats or oftentimes I just completely avoid oats if they Same. serve oats just because oats tend to be not yeah. gluten free. Yeah, um, absolutely. Most yeah, of the I'm, time. Yeah. I'm on the same boat with the, the oats. I, I avoid it. But I did just see your story recently about the tested gluten free oats. And I actually ended up getting a bag after I saw your story. I haven't tried them yet because I'm still scared. I'm like still a little skittish. But I scanned the bag and it said no, it said no gluten detected. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the first time in 12 years that I might actually be able to just eat a new food that I haven't it, eaten forever. It's amazing. Yeah. Zigo Foods. I mean, they're, they're, they're really that they, I just, I met the, the owner, the founder, and she is extremely passionate about it, which is amazing. So, um, and when you talk to somebody who, and she has celiac disease too. Mm -hmm. So she okay. is passionate she for her it. own personal yeah. health. Um, and I have never talked to somebody that was that deep down into, I mean, she's, she's on the production side of it, like the growing of the oats and the, you know, she is deep in to make sure that what is coming out of those fields is completely safe. And that, when you hear that, that makes you feel complete. Yeah, it's not really amazing. a faceless, a faceless corporation with, you know, millions of um, fields all over. She is, she's deep into it. So and they taste great too. So yeah, I'm excited yeah. to try. Maybe I'll give it a try this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Finally dive in. I'm like so skittish because I've avoided them for so long. You know how you're just like, oh, you're like, I don't want to do it because I don't want to feel sick for a week. But then at the same time, you like, you know, sometimes you have to just try it and you're like, oh, and I have a whole new food I can eat. So it's, uh, it's always scary. Yeah, try a little. It's always scary, but then good once you have like a good experience. <laughs> but yeah, so that's a yeah, good idea. Try yeah. like a a little yeah. bit of it. Yeah, just I do just just do a little taster on it because and then and then wait to see because you just never know. I, I do know some people with celiac disease react to the the protein in oats, mm. the avenin, avenin mm -hmm. I think it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So some people don't digest that as well. But I, I don't seem to have a problem with it. And it's been kind of, I, I was the same as you. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of a fun. And they're Suki approved. So <laughs> my system. they're Suki approved. They're Suki okay. Approved. Got the yeah. stamp of approval. And so I, a new thing that I feel like has been kind of an issue for us in the celiac world is takeout containers being made from wheat straw or wheat products. Has Suki ever alerted on any of like the takeout containers or straws have been a big thing that, you know, people have been talking about potentially having gluten in as well. I get the question about straws all the time. I am super weird about paper straws. Me personally, I just can't stand the feeling of them. So I tend to, when I see them, just go, please stay away. I don't want to even hold those because I'm going to throw it away. So I haven't had her test that many just because I personally don't like them. Um, where I will say as far as I haven't, we haven't had issues with takeout containers. I can't say that I had specifically any wheat straw ones. Um, where I have had her alert to was recycled paper plates. Um, so I had actually bought them. I have a video of it even. Um, I bought them from Costco. It's one of those, you know, massive things for uh, training purposes, because I thought, oh, this will be perfect when we're starting to do training with gluten. So you have to do a plate of food without and a plate with. And I'm like, I don't want gluten on my plates. So let's just buy these paper plates to do it. And she just kept alerting. And I'm like, this is so weird. It's just a plate of lettuce and she's still alerting. And then I brought the plates out and she alerted to them. So I do think a lot of that in the recycled. Now, on the other side was I ate stuff off those plates, not very often, but I didn't get sick. So I think there's some where, you know, it's so it's it's there, but it's still so small that don't don't worry about it. Um, oh, and I will say she did alert to some strange like plastic containers at a dedicated mm. gluten free place. Mm -hmm. But then when I asked them to plate them, for me. I remember this video. They were perfectly yeah, fine. And it was fine. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you just never know. I mean, part of me goes, we could be paranoid 
down to the nth degree. It's easy to be when you're celiac. <laughs> it's easy to be paranoid about anything is, you're like touching and putting near your mouth. So yeah. yeah. Suki has made made me feel a lot more confident in that. So I haven't run into those nearly as much as you would hear on um, on the internet, on social media. People are like, well watch out for this, watch out for that. I haven't run into it that often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Awesome. And then so you have a course coming up, coming out soon that you're planning to to launch and it's about training a gluten detection dog. Do you want to share a little bit about that and what that's going to entail? So, so I am working with um, my my friend, uh, Carrie Bastier, who is a gluten detection trainer that I recommend. And because one of the things that I keep hearing these horror stories about, you know, people making these bad decisions. I've talked about those. So we decided to really put together the steps of how to train, not how to train, because you got to work with a trainer, but all those pieces leading up to it. So, you know, finding the breeder, figuring out what dog is right for you, figuring out how to test the dog, some of the basic behavior and manners, all those pieces, and then kind of some of the basics of of gluten detection. So what the process looks like so that people can understand, because one of the things that I know for me going into it, this is going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be a major commitment of time and money for me. Plus it's a lifetime of a dog. I don't want to get into it without knowing a lot of stuff. So I did tons of research, but I still didn't do enough. So this will be everything in one nutshell so that you can go, okay, I'm ready for it. So if you are sitting at home going, you know what, in four years, I want one, or in two years, I want one. One year, I want. you are getting the details for here's what it is. Or if it's a, hey, it's a wish in the future, I need to really save up or fundraise or, you know, figure out how to, how to pay for this dog, this, it would be good for you. So we're, we're in the process. Um, We should have some launching, you know, in the next, in the next little bit. I'm hoping by the, by the end of August and um, it should be very exciting so that everybody can, you know, take these, these online courses and just, you know, go through them at their leisure and, learn what they need to before they are making those those big decisions so that they can feel equipped to go yeah this is for me or you know what i'm not quite ready for it today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah awesome well this has been amazing thank you so much for sharing all this information and insight into life with a service dog and specifically a gluten detection dog it's i always like you know there's so many questions i'm sure people have out there so i hope we answered some of people's questions and and what it's like to to have one. So thank you so much for sharing everything. Absolutely. Oh, you're welcome. And I have tons of information on my website and um, you can always see me on on Instagram is where I usually spend most of my time. So I I post lots of videos on there. I'm also on TikTok and YouTube and Facebook. But We'll link to all of that so that you can see you as well. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, Kendra. Thank you so much, Erica. Mm -hmm.